This is message number 12, if, if you count from the beginning. The horn of Gabriel, the breaking of the seventh seal. In chapter 6, we released the first six seals. And then in chapter 7, we had that great pause, that pause for redemption, that pause for grace, that pause for revival, for the last true great awakening when God would not only save, but seal through the power of the Holy Spirit, 144,000 Jewish missionaries, very similar to the Apostle Paul. And of those, all would lead what we believe to be millions of people to Jesus Christ during the great tribulation. We've already covered the rapture God's remnant is gone. The tribulation is at hand. The six seals, the, the unending scroll has been revealed and then there's been a pause for a great revival, a great outpouring. And now the seventh seal is being released and the seven trumpet judgments that go with it. As I warned you two weeks ago, now things are going to get difficult. And if this is your first Wednesday night and you haven't been following along on our Abbas House app or online, this message will seem harsh to you. But this message is proof that God is a just God, that he is a God that is redemptive in nature. His purpose for being is that all might be saved and experience his grace, but there comes a time when those who have been pushed aside, mistreated, abandoned, abused, even murdered, those who refuse to accept Christ will come under the judgment of the tribulation. And that's what we get into tonight. The scroll is completely and finally opened and the seventh seal releases the seven trumpet judgments which will be followed by the bold judgments, beginning with verse one of chapter eight. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me. If you're watching online, pull it up on your phone. You wanna follow along, that's how you learn. As you're turning there, I will give you some review of the seals because we took a pause last week. The first seal is the Antichrist. We've described to you who he is and what he will do. He will sign a peace treaty with Israel and will be held a hero. And then we'll try to take over. Next, warfare, worldwide warfare. The third seal is famine. The fourth seal is death. The fifth is martyrdom. The sixth is the shaking of the atmospheres. And the seventh seal tonight releases the trumpet judgments. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Why the silence in heaven? Well, because finally and ultimately, every person of faith gets to see this scroll and all of the seals revealed at one time and they know and are very aware of the judgment, the wrath that's about to be poured out on the earth. The wrath is so harsh and so devastating, it's beyond anything they have ever imagined or that they've ever seen, and there is a silence. How many of you know before a jury comes back to declare whether a person is innocent or guilty, there is a silence in the courtroom whenever you're waiting a decision that impacts your life a great deal, there will oftentimes be a calm before the answer or a calm, as we say, before the storm. You know, before a storm moves in, the birds will quit singing. There'll be a quietness and it's almost spooky, the quietness before the storm makes its way in. And I saw the seven angels. Who were those seven angels? 
We can't say with 100% degree of certainty, but we believe them to be archangels. We believe them to be the archangel Michael or Gabriel, the ones that showed up to the Virgin Mary. We believe them to be the warring angels who stand before God. And to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings and a great earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound off. The first trumpet can be described as vegetation being struck. Here's what the word of God says. The first angel sounded and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood and they were thrown to the earth and you'll see fractions here uh, in these verses. You only see a portion of devastation in these first four trumpet judgments. He says a third of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. So vegetation is impacted first with the first trumpet. Second trumpet, the seas were struck. This is what it says. Then the second angel sounded and something like a great mountain burning with fire. Many theologians believe this was some kind of meteor shower was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. You can follow along to the plagues of Egypt when Pharaoh refused to let God's people go and you'll see parallels to these trumpets and those plagues and the sea became blood and a third of the living creatures in the sea died and the third of the ships were destroyed. The third trumpet, the waters were struck. Then the third angel sounded and a great star fell from heaven burning like a torch and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. If your water's polluted and your vegetation is struck, how many of you no, that's going to make living very difficult for the people who remain. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood and many died from the water because it was made bitter or poisonous. Fourth trumpet, the heavens struck. Then the fourth angel sounded and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine and likewise the night. And I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. I do believe, and this may be a shock to some of you, just like my friend, Dr. Jeffress, I believe that we should take care of our planet. I don't believe that we are to be bad stewards of our water, our land. I believe you should uh, recycle if you can. I believe that we should be good stewards of the ground that God uh, has given us. But I also believe that what we are dealing with, with the ozone, and global warming and all of these issues, including pollution, many of these things, I believe, are the results of our own decisions. When Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, I believe it didn't just bring a spiritual curse on mankind, it brought a physical curse on our environment. And I do believe we are dealing with what we are dealing with as far as climate change and all of these things because of sin, sin that entered the world and the consequences of sin. When God made the universe, what did he say in Genesis 1? He pronounced everything good. He said, everything is good. Everybody say all good. 
He called Adam and Eve good. He called his creation good. He said, listen, this is all good. But when Satan became prince of this air, a shift occurred. Creation has suffered from sin as much as mankind has. This is what the word of God says. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willing, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be de delivered from the bondage of corruption into glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. So creation has been jacked up because of sin because it has been subjected to sin and it cries out for deliverance just as our souls, we should be crying out for deliverance for the soon coming return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Creation needs redemption just as much as we do because we are a part of his creation. So, yes, I believe that things are in motion for the return of Jesus Christ, but I don't believe it's a good witness to not take care of our planet and those God has placed in our planet. Amen? You can call me whatever you want. Number one, the breaking of the seventh seal. This is the final seal and the coming trumpet judgments. The seventh trumpet, which includes all of the bowl judgments as well, teaches us that judgment builds on other judgments of God. In other words, when you commit a sin and you don't repent and you continue to go from sin to trespassing to iniquity to bondage, when you continue on that path, you will not just be judged once. Can I get an amen from somebody? If you know better and you refuse to do better, you're going to receive judgment on top of judgment. And guess what? Sometimes you'll be innocent, but because you've continued on that path, you will even face judgment for things you didn't do. Because when you're on that path, you remove the protective covering that is Adonai. That covering will not keep you from everything this world has to offer you, but there is a level of protection when you're walking with God that you will receive that you won't receive when you're in rebellion. So when Jesus the Lamb broke the seventh seal, three things happened. A silence in heaven for 30 minutes. This silence and the release of these judgment took heaven's breath away. Next, seven angels and seven trumpets are mentioned. What does a trumpet mean in the word of God? What do trumpets symbolize? Why trumpets? Well, let me just mention a few things that trumpets represent in the word of God to help you. The first is ceremonial procession. Trumpets begin and end most Hebraic celebrations or ceremonies. Trumpets represent God's presence and his involvement in humanity. Jewish people use trumpets to not only gather people, but to call them to action or to set them off on a great journey. Trumpets were also a sign of war. They would release that trumpet, that horn would blow when it was time to fight. I believe a trumpet needs to be heard in Zion and in the Gentile Church of America that it may be time to fight. Somebody say amen. I believe we need to hear the trumpet in this season. We need to stiffen our backs and we need to understand that we've got to fight for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've got to fight for our children. We've got to fight for the gospel of Christ. Trumpets were also used to celebrate special or holy days to announce the new year, Rosh Hashanah. Also, trumpets were used when the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. So God uses these trumpets. They're significant. They're spiritual. 
and they speak to us. Matthew 24, verse 31. And he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And my favorite verse about the horn of Gabriel that I quote in most funerals that I do for the saved, for the Lord himself, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So how many of you are saved tonight? Saved, spirit-filled, proud of it? Well, guess what? You're going to get to hear a trumpet, amen? Because that trumpet will sound when he comes for his bride, amen? We're going to get to hear that thing, those of us that know Jesus Christ, and we will reign with Jesus Christ, amen? But our friends in the tribulation will hear this, and it will reveal that judgment is at hand. Number two, it mentions here the angel with the golden censer. I put in parentheses sacrifice, prayer, and worship because those are the three things that this represents to us as believers. Here's what it says in verse three of Revelation chapter eight. Then another angel having a golden censer, kind of like a golden receptacle, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And it says, and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Okay, all that sounds very spooky. But here's what it represents. In the Old Testament, there were two altars. There was the brazen altar, which was the altar of sacrifice, where the priest, the Levitical priest, they would slaughter animals as, as an offering Constantly, This was the brazen altar, but there was a golden altar of incense that stood in the holy place just beyond the veil, okay? And this is where God made restitution and propitiation for all the people of Israel. So you have one that's brazen that represents sacrifice and one that represents God's presence, amen? Because there is no presence without sacrifice, amen? There is no presence without the shed blood of Jesus Christ. This second altar was made of gold. There were burning coals in the middle of it. On the day of atonement, the high priest would fill the golden censer with incense and sprinkle it on the hot coals on the altar, releasing the fragrant aroma. It represents the uh, worship of God, that sweet smelling aroma that you've heard preached about. What does this mean to us? Well, this is what it says in verse five. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So wrap your mind around this if you can. So there's this angel in what we know is the golden altar. And just like the great high priest, he's doing everything the great high priest of the old covenant would do, but he releases the prayers of the saints and the worship of God's people upward. He releases all the good things of God upward, all the prayers, all the worship, but then he throws judgment to the earth. Could it be that the prayers of the saints are part of the reason for the judgment of God? Just hang with me for a second. Think of all the people falsely accused over the last two or 3,000 years. Think of all the people who were abused. Think of all the prayers for people crying out, asking God why. Why did you do this? Why did I lose my dad? Why is this happening to me? All the injustice that's happened to this earth. Think of all the injustice that's happening today to the church of Jesus Christ in our beloved United States of America. Think of all the injustice, different people groups from the Native Americans to the African Americans to our Jewish friends, all the injustice people have faced for what they believe in, all the crimes against humanity and all the prayers. The Bible says that every prayer is heard by God. And these are the prayers of the saints. So after thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years of grace and, and love and second chances, even a pause in these seals for 
people to come to Christ and for 144,000 evangelists to go out and share the gospel with those that remain in the tribulation. All this grace God has bestowed because he is redemptive in nature. And then finally, judgment comes. It also speaks to the importance of prayer. And I will be going there this Sunday morning, so I won't go there tonight, but I will tease it a little bit and it'll be a lot more rowdy Sunday morning uh, and more inspiration Sunday morning education tonight. But let me say this, your prayers matter. A great theologian says, said the history belongs to the intercessor. Our history belongs to the intercessor. What matters is your presence and your relationship with the king, what you say. Intercession is praying on behalf of someone else. Supplication is what I call supply and demand. It's asking God for what you need for the work ahead of you and expecting him to show up. Amen? I'm getting ahead of myself. Intercession is praying on behalf of someone else. Supplication is supply and demand. It's asking God and believing that he'll do it. It's not just asking. You've got to believe God's going to answer your prayers. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. Believe God will do it. That is supplication. Then you have thanksgiving. That is being thankful for what God has done in your life, for you, your family. Even when you don't feel like being thankful, thank him anyways. And then spiritual praying. Praying in the spirit, Ephesians 6. That is praying inside of yourself, allowing that inner man, that hero within to pray through you in the king's language, which man can't understand. Spiritual pray. Your prayers matter, God hears them. The first four trumpets. Now we shift from heaven to earth. This has been thrown down to earth. Judgment is being released from ecstasy to reality, from grace to judgment. God has always given us so much time to accept him, to follow him, to love him, to serve him. But there's always judgment, just like Pharaoh, just like Hitler. The reign of evil will come to an end, my friend. And it can come to a heavenly end or it can come to a hellish end. But to torment God's people and to stand against what God's word says is to put yourself in harm's way with an avenging and loving God. This, these four trumpets came in short, rapid blasts, so it wasn't like a long, drawn-out, shofar, you know, trumpet blow. They were quick, they were to the point, and they targeted the natural world, land, sea, rivers, and heavenly bodies. So, the first four trumpets. The first trumpet represents fire on earth. Everybody say fire. Many believe the earthquake we taught you about two chapters ago could have released volcanic activity. We really don't know, but what we do know, according to the word of God, is that the fire burns a third of the earth. What is the lesson there for us? While I do believe we need to take care of our ozone and take care of our earth, there are a lot of people out there worshiping creation and not the creator. I was talking to a, a friend of mine from my childhood. She's in uh, children's ministry at a very large church in Florida. She was three or four years older than me. And we were just talking about the Lord. And she told me one time, she said, you know, many people are interested in all the gifts God gives them, but sometimes they are so passionate about his gifts, they forget the giver. Man, that's good. Every charismatic needs to hear that, and I am one. I'm a full believer, a full gospel believer. I believe in all the gifts of the Spirit. I operate in them. But some of you jump from fad to fad, moment to moment, movement to movement. You have no substance. You can't stay anywhere. You have no theological foundation because you're so interested in the gifts. You forgot to give her. And some well-meaning people are so interested in worshiping the creation that they failed to worship the creator. I mean, I'm thankful for 
science. I'm thankful for this world that we live in. I believe in it. I'm not a fool. But at the same time, I see a lot of science worship and worship of creation. And we failed to remember our creator. We failed to have faith in a supreme being. We failed to give God all the praise that he's due. And remember the blood his son shed on Calvary for us. We've got to have faith that his word is true. So it represents fire on earth. Second Peter chapter three, verse seven warned us of this. It says, but the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So we knew it was coming. The second trumpet, blood in the sea, just like the children of Israel, very similar. And Pharaoh, speaking of the plagues of Israel, very similar. Then the second angel sounded and something like a great mounting burning with fire was thrown into the sea and the sea became like blood. As I said, great theologians and scientific minds believe that this great mountain could be a large meteor. Uh, in 2013, a 65 foot meteor spotted by Russian intelligence going 40 miles an hour was noticed 30 times the force of the atomic bomb was, that was dropped over Hiroshima, a meteor going that fast, 30 times as forceful as the atomic bomb was headed to our world. It can happen, friends. So it says one third of all the fish and sea creatures died. So they estimate, um, you know, about 100 million sea creatures are in our oceans today. So a third gone. And the water turns to blood. You think that would get anyone's attention? I would hope so. Third trumpet. Attack on fresh water. The third angel sounded and a great star fell from heaven burning like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of the water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. So there are 165 roughly major rivers in the world and thousands of creeks and streams. So one third of those would no longer be drinkable. It would not be safe to drink out of those waters any longer. Um, I found this interesting. The World Health Organization says that 852,000 people a year die from contaminated water. Does that shock anyone? It does me. 852,000 people die from contaminated water each year. And we do our best as a church, along with Samaritan's Purse, to try to get clean water into every region of the earth to take care of God's people. But the asteroid, it says, is called Wormwood. It means bitter and represents divine punishment according to Exodus 7 in chapter 15. This is what it says. In chapter 15, verse 22 of Exodus. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went out into the wilderness of Shur and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. See, everything in the new covenant you can find in the old covenant if you'll look, friends. Everything in the New Testament is in the old covenant. The old covenant is a type and shadow that points to the New Testament every time every time and they went three days in the wilderness found no water now when they came to Mara they could not drink the waters of Mara for they were bitter therefore the name of it was called Mara and the people complained against Moses saying what shall we drink so he cried out to the Lord the Lord showed him a tree and when he cast it in the waters the waters were made sweet and he made a statue and an ordinance for them there the fourth trumpet says one third of the sun and the moon and the stars are struck and darkness covers the whole earth. 
the fourth angel sounded, and the third of the sun was struck, third of the moon. Could you imagine the darkness that would cover the earth? What does darkness represent? And I'm not talking about any kind of color. I'm talking about actual darkness where you can't see anything. It represents evil. It's what the Bible teaches. It represents a lack of hope, punishment. Darkness represents judgment. So when a third of the sun, the moon, and the stars, when a third of them are shot, and you can't see, and darkness covers the earth, it's a picture of God's judgment. So we see that our water supply is ruined. Our major food source, because of the lack of light now, the food sources are ruined. And then there's a pause for a loud warning. And those that remain are under the lure of the Antichrist. They're tempted because of their own desperation to worship anyone to get them out of this darkness, anyone. So people make it seem like that we're just gonna be going along, living our American lives, having everything that most of the world doesn't have, living this privileged life, and then we're gonna have to decide, do I take the mark of the beast or do I not? No, friend, that's not the way it works. The rapture's already occurred. Hallelujah, those of us that know Jesus and believe that way, amen. We're out of here. Suffering comes, great revival comes, 144,000 missionaries evangelize both Jew and Gentile. Great revival happens. Then the seventh seal is released. Judgment falls to the ground. Darkness covers the earth. They're starving. They have no water. They're miserable. People are being raped and pillaged and living for today because they feel like they have no hope. So of course they'd take a mark of the beast. Just like how many of you, and if you, if you say you have it, you're lying, you, you've said about someone who's stealing to feed their children, well, they're just stealing to feed their children. Well, in this scenario, they're just gonna take the mark because they're starving, they have no water, but that's because the judgment of God is on them and on this atmosphere because we've rejected him and consequences fall on the unbeliever. This is what it says in the last verse of this chapter. And I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice again, woe, 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 which is a warning to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. So there's a brief pause after these first four trumpets and there are three to come next Wednesday night. What does that mean to us as we see the judgment of God falling on a sin-plagued world? Well, First, I think it needs to give us some hope that there are better days ahead for those of us who know Jesus, but also give us the reality of how things are gonna end for our loved ones, for the people who don't know Christ. I'll never forget, Kelly and I went to Las Vegas one time. We've went a few times now, but I think this is one of the early times we went. And we were wanting to go see a show and we decided to go see Penn and Teller, the illusion guys. And we really didn't have a number of options because it was the day we got there. And if you, you know, if you go, you gotta get the good tickets in advance. So we thought we'd go. Well, I read a story and saw a YouTube video. Um, the taller one is an atheist, a devout atheist. And one night after a show, a young man gave him a Bible because he greets. We got our picture made with him and all that when we left the show. And uh, I told him I was a pastor and he said, God bless you. I'm not sure how that works. An atheist telling me God bless me, but I took it. Um, <clears throat> but a young man handed him a Bible, told him that Jesus loved him. The young man didn't think anything about it, 
but about two or three o'clock in the morning, Vegas time, that evening, the next morning, I guess, he goes on and he goes live on YouTube and he is puzzled beyond belief because you and I know the Holy Spirit was messing with his atheism. And he's rambling, and I'm sure you can go to YouTube. Is the tall one pin or teller, Kelly? I can't remember which one. I think the tall one's pin. It's the tall one. And he goes on YouTube, and he is talking about Christianity. And he said, you know, I don't believe like that man, but that was a great man. And he continues in his live YouTube video to call this young man that gave him a Bible a great man. And he said, he's just a great man. He believes in what he believes in. And he said, I, you know, I honor anybody who truly believes what they believe. And I respect it in this country. And he's given this video. And the last thing he said before he went off was, how much do you have to hate somebody not to tell them? And that has never left me. How much do you have to hate somebody not to tell them? So here's an atheist comedian, illusionist, trafficking with new age and demonic activity. But someone handed him a Bible. The Holy Spirit woke him up. He knew God or some force had done something kind for him. He goes on live and he looks at Christians and says, how much do you have to hate somebody not to tell them about Jesus? Powerful powerful so we need to tell our friends about the love of Jesus we don't need to beat them down with religion but we need to tell them that they are forgiven that they are loved that they can accept God's free gift of mercy that he's available to them that he will never leave them or forsake them so I always give people an opportunity to make Jesus Lord of their lives so if you need Jesus right now I just want you to say Lord forgive me come into my heart and save me Fill me with your spirit and use me for your glory. I want you in my life, Jesus. Come in right now. I accept your free gift of love and grace. But for the rest of you, you're Christians. Stand on your feet tonight. This is a challenge I'm putting on myself as much as I'm putting on you, those of you in here tonight, and those of you watching online. I just close with those words from Penn, from Penn and Teller. How much do we have to hate them? not to tell them. So I want us to become a inviting and investing and a soul winning church, amen? I'm not interested in another movement. I'm interested in the souls of the lost and them finding Christ. Is everybody good with that? And we all need to up our game, including the pastor and in inviting, investing and sharing our faith with people who don't know Jesus. If you're willing to join me in that battle, I just want you to lift your hand. Let me pray for us tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for this awesome church, this wonderful congregation. Lord, may we all be your hands and feet, your heart, your light in a dark world. Lord, we know true darkness is coming in the tribulation, but right now we have light, we have hope, we have grace. So Lord, may we be bold in our faith. May we invite our friends to hear the gospel. May we go above and beyond to serve people in need. Lord, may we go after the lost sheep that are hurting, that are in the struggle, that are willing to follow and to be sheared and to be taught. Lord, may you give us the spiritual eyes to identify those who want to grow and not do harm, those who want to serve and not be sought, those who want to love and to be loved, those who want to grow and make a kingdom impact. Lord, as the pastor, I repent for times I haven't shared my faith like I should have. Lord, make me better. And as you're making me better, make this congregation better in loving people and inviting people and sharing our testimonies and sharing our faith stories of how you've shown up for us in the past. Lord, may we be willing to invite, invest, to love, to share, to show grace every time we come in contact with people who are either 
disenfranchised, disloyal, or lost. May we show them the way out. May we love them enough to tell them the truth. In Jesus' name, we commit to being inviters and investors. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you all. I'll see you back Sunday morning starting a series, Double Portion. You don't want to miss it. It's a two-part series. God bless you. I'll be hanging out over here just a little bit. If you need to see me, I'd love to see you. Have a wonderful night.